John, you're back in Dublin. Another big bell to our card, 270, coming our way Friday night. How's it feel to be back? Uh, it's fantastic, yeah, for a number of reasons. You know, it's, I feel it's the first big event going on in Dublin um, since all of this madness. And it's going to be incredible to be in the Tree Arena with 10,000 screaming fans and another big Bellator card. And um, from top to bottom, every fight as a fan, I'm, I'm excited to see. A lot of them are 50-50 fights, and it's, it's going to be really interesting to watch a play out. And we've got SPG fighters involved right up the very top in our headline and co-head. We've got Queedy Pitbull. We've got James fighting mix as well. Um, How does it feel for you going into these big nights? Obviously, you've been at this now for quite some time. Uh, has your own approach to these big occasions changed? Um, I'm probably getting a little bit calmer each time. Uh, you know, you get more familiar with the various stresses and anxiety that comes with the build-up towards a show like this. So it's certainly uh, getting a little bit easier, but of course it still is nerve-wracking and, and the fights are so uh, meaningful, especially this time. It's, um, it's Peter Creeley's first crack at a Bellator title, SPG's second crack at a Bellator title. Um, and that brings added tension, but we've done all that we can. Um, usually that's when I'm at my most calm, as if I feel the fighter has done all that he can. Um, we're ready for the result. And on the night, just yourself and the build-up to a big fight or kind of even your corner work, how different is that for, depending on the different characters that you're working with or the different personalities? You do have a different approach with different fighters. Some, if you imagine your energy level, like 10 is where you're having, you know, you're absolutely the most excited you can be and zero is when you're asleep. Some guys want to be kept in fives. Some want to be built up to eight, nines. Some would rather be down at one twos. So that's something that only can come with experience. You have to have done a lot of fights and all of my guys on this card have been with me for a long time. So I kind of know who it is. You run backstage and you're kind of like, you know, let's go get this guy. You're going to do it. Or let's go prove it to the world. You're going to do it. Let's go do this for yourself. Let's go do this, this for your family. So you kind of have to find the trigger points for different athletes. Yeah, absolutely. And you've obviously come as synonymous with the winner learn mantra just for yourself, say over the past year or two, do you still feel like you're learning or are there any big kind of things that you've taken on board? Oh, specifically? Uh, every day is a school day in this game. It's like, I feel the more I'm learning, even from a technical point of view, the more it's showing me how little I know. So every day is a, every day you learn something. There's always some nuance, some, some learning process um, going on. And, you know, even with it, within the sport, the individual skills, whether it's striking skills, takedown skills, submission skills, you're getting good at one area and then you've got to run back and spin the plates for those other areas that you've maybe ignored for a little bit. So it's, it's impossibly beautiful to try and get good at this sport. <laughs> and even just, you mentioned there the technical side of things. Do you think that the speed of evolution has kind of increased as the sport is kind of maturing and you've kind of got more, more talk going into it, more people trying things out, or do you think it's kind of easy to overstate how quickly things are evolving? Yeah, even just the caliber of athlete MMA is attracting now. Like, let's say 15 years ago, um, if you were really good at boxing, you would, you would go into boxing because that's where the best, that's where the most money is. Or if you were just in general a really good athlete, you might go to basketball or, or football or whatever. But now it's being seen as a, you know, a viable career option for these guys in their mid-teens and when they're starting to kind of choose a sport that they're going to take more serious. And we can see that now with the guys that are under 25 in the sport. They may, they may only have a couple of years martial arts training behind them, but they're just such high-level athletes. What do you have to show them? Like, put your hands up, throw a few jabs, and run at a guy. And then, uh, you know, as we add technique to that. So, for me, the sport is only getting more interesting every year. And even the different styles, you know, we've got... All of, all of the guys from the, the Russian countries, you know, doing so well at the moment. Great grapplers, great wrestlers. We have the Nigerian champions coming through. It's, I love the sport that it's truly global and you just never know where the next guy or the next style or which country is going to dominate next. It's what keeps it very interesting. And even say with fighters you're working with yourself, like over the last few years, we've seen even Bellator, like... Big Bellator Knights in the Tree Arena have become a staple of the Irish fighting scene, the Irish uh, sporting landscape. Um, has that given your fighters a lot more stability? Can, can I, do we have more people here who can kind of focus in and maybe have a bit more uh, 
financial stability to focus on training? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's been huge. It was always back in the day, guys are trying to juggle, I don't know, working before, after, you know, training and doing security work at the weekends and always a lot of stress. And then you know, we were very lucky to have signed a lot of to, to the organization where it's, you know, you can get fighters on the UK circuit that are on the UK level shows and they're called professional fighters, but they all have to work a job because if you were to work out how much they're earning, even fighting four times a year, which would be quite a lot, it would still be less than what someone would get stacking shelves in Aldi. Um, whereas guys on, on a Bellator contract are genuinely making uh, a, a living, livable wage, if you want to say, and even far beyond that, thankfully. And it means that they can not only just train martial arts full time and take their rest seriously, but they can also do, do other things like hire a proper nutritionist, a proper strength and conditioning coach. And all, and all the other things. And again, that's, that's elevating the sport. It's elevating the level of athlete we have in the sport. And that just makes my job much easier and, and much more fun that I've just got to focus on the, just the martial arts techniques, which is what I love to do. And just yourself, uh, you talked about spinning plates there in terms of techniques a few minutes ago. How is your own plate spinning going? Sort of, how's your typical week, if there is a typical week split between, obviously you guys made a big step up with the gym facility here in Dublin. You've got so many fighters under you. Um, what's kind of, how, how are all these things sort of being balanced by yourself these days? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. I usually wake up uh, early and that's where I'm dealing with uh, calls from Australia because I'm involved heavily in uh, Wimps Warrior. And that's, that's really after taking off. It's gone much further, much faster than any of us expected. So that, that's huge. So kind of from 6 a.m. till 8 a.m. is, is, based around that because that's their day and then I have I go to the gym I have my 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 big class my 11 a.m MMA class that's, that's the big one for me and then I have usually meetings with fighters or talking to promoters for a couple of hours after that and then as we come into the evening that's when America is waking up and I'm dealing with all the U.S. calls so it's it's sort of like it's been 6 a.m till 10 p.m uh, every day for me now for the last feels like years to be honest um but it's been going on a while and it's you know i have a new well he's 15 months old now a baby and you're trying to make sure everybody gets a bit of you and gets a bit of time and it's very difficult but one of the biggest things and biggest helps i had was taking on um my lifelong best friend david roach he's he's the co uh, coach with me now he's taken so much of that workload off my shoulders and he's been an incredible help all this week he was the one in the hotel with the guys helping with the weight cuts which led me which gave me freedom to stay in the gym for Sinead Kavanagh's final week before going out to the states so uh yeah he, he's been an incredible amount of help and just two final things just you mentioned weight cutting there um it's obviously a conversation and a topic that's never really going to go away I'm just wondering in general what do you think of kind of are there alternatives to the current system that you'd like to see in place, whether that's more weight classes or something else? Or do you think that kind of what we have at the moment is a necessary evil and kind of just part of the process of fighting? It's, it's going to get better. And the, the main reason why I think it's going to get better is that the, the current wave of guys coming up in their late teens, they're now competing in IMAF, the International MMA Federation. So for the first time, uh, I guess they're, you know, it's going on a couple of years now, but we, je- we have a real um a genuine athlete pathway for amateurs to be able to represent their country in national european and world championships they weigh in the same day four days in a row for those tournaments so they're getting they're getting more familiar with training and competing at their healthy walking weight and those athletes now we're starting to see them come into their early 20s and creep over into professional fighting whereas Air sport was kind of weird that the professional element of it was the first thing to come along. And then 20 years later, people start saying, actually, we should do something for the amateurs. So I think the wave of amateurs coming through, a great example would be Kieran Clark, who's fighting on this card. Kieran Clark did 30 odd uh, amateur fights with IMAF. So when he crossed over to pro, he never leaves himself more than a couple of kilos over his competitive weight and can do it very comfortably in two or three days, you know, skip a few muffins and he's, he's basically hung weight so kind of the old mentality of trying to cut 20 pounds in 24 hours is is thankfully i believe on the way out these new wave guys are not cutting that weight they're going into the bouts 
full of energy, full of beans. And the guys are saying, you know what? Just being a couple of kilos heavier than somebody is not going to be enough if I don't have the gas tank to go with it. And so that's interesting. So you could see more people competing more kind of true to weight <laughs> rather than crashing down to kind of, you know, get that advantage. Yes. More so I do, than... I do have other, uh, I think, very simple solutions to it that, like, for example, uh, let's say with the UFC, they have uh, random drug testing. Why not stick a scales in your bag when you're doing the random drug testing and stick them on the scales? And if you are, let's say, three times, you're more than 10% of your competitive weight, you go up a weight class. You know, and, and then everybody would just be going up a few weight classes. And even for uh, organizations that don't have something like USADA, you could have in every major city, let's say, a, a, an agreed upon center you go to once a month to step on the scales. Like we have the, uh, let's say, the Amateur Wrestling Association in Ireland. It's, it's recognized by Sport Ireland. It's, it's a longstanding organization. Why not have it that all Irish-based fighters have to go there and they step on the scales? And again, you're over 10% of your competitive body weight, whoop a weight class. So there, there is, I, I believe, easy-ish solutions to this. And just kind of another potential kind of bl like blunt, easy to put in solution could be something like more weight divisions. Would you be in favor of something like a one, six, five, five division across? Well, I, I, I definitely think there should be like what happened there goes 25, 35, 45, 55, 70. So you're, you're putting a bigger weight gap in, the, in where most men on the planet fall between. There's not too many men 125 and not too many men 265. But most of us are between 150, uh, 150 and say 180. And yet that's only got two weight classes. That's, that doesn't make sense. So it should be every 10 pounds. You know, 25 to 265, uh, well, let's say 205. Do it every 10 pounds up, up the way. I wouldn't like to see it every five pounds or every three pounds like boxing. I'm not too sure the weight class is there. I think it'd be good just every 10 pounds. Even with that, you're still going to have the odd person that wants to do massive weight cuts. So I think it's going to be solved long term by IMAF because all of the best fighters are going to be coming through IMAF within about five or ten years time there'll be no major promotion that doesn't have a, a champion that was originally an IMAF champion we're seeing that already um, and they will have come with the mentality of let's stay close to competitive weight well I'm able to make my my competitive weight four days in a row uh, on the amateur scene you know let's stick with that and so I think generationally it'll be solved yeah, that's really interesting stuff and be interested to see kind of how it all plays out. Just one final question. You've obviously been involved with the process of trying to get MMA recognized in Ireland and kind of get formal regulation. I'm um, just wondering what the current status of that is and just if you could maybe explain to people why it's so important from your perspective for the sport to be formally recognized. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working closely with Sport Ireland now. As we all know, the last two years has been just a bit all over the place. Gyms shut down for 18 months and, and so on. So that certainly has slowed things down. But we have a very strong uh, board on this. We have very strong uh, uh, plan. You know, we have a four-year development plan. We've, we've basically done all the paperwork that's required, which is a lot. You know, three years uh, audit accounts for our association. It goes on and on and on. When I start getting into this, I just thought it'd be like, oh, well, this is MMA. Can we get it? And I was like, nah, this is you're on a five-year plan here, which has become seven years because of, of, the, of the delays. So we're working closely with Sport Ireland, and I'm, I'm very confident that we will get there. Why is it important? Well, I just think that every kid should have the honor of being able to represent their country in a sport recognized by their country. Sport Ireland are the, are the body that, uh, you know, for the Irish government that decide which sports are, in, in my mind, which are legitimate and which are not, which are going towards Olympic recognition. And, and that's what I see the future of this. I'd love my, my own son is 15 months old. Who knows? Maybe in a, couple, in a decade, a decade and a half, he wants to do this. And I'd love him to be able to pull on an Irish jersey with the same level of pride that a football player does or a tennis player or a boxer. And um, so that's, that's been my, my dream and goal from the start. And uh, we're, we're not going to stop till we get that. So I hope uh, Sport Ireland get on board sooner rather than later. Well, we'll watch that space and we'll see how your little lad gets on over the next uh, 15, 18, 25 years. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Good stuff, John. Thanks for your time this morning. Bellator 270, Friday night to Tree Arena. Cheers, John.